please turn to Exodus chapter 24 this evening. We will work through this chapter together. Uh, we know that uh, mountain, mountains are very dangerous places, don't we? Um, you may have heard of George Mallory and Sandy Irving. They attempted first to ascend Mount Everest on the 8th of June, 1924. They did so with the most primitive equipment you could imagine, basic ropes. Their uh, winter weather gear consisted of um, a cap and a tweed jacket. Uh, they uh, disappeared 800 feet below the summit of Everest. And the question remains today whether they actually made it to the top of Mount Everest. Uh, they died close to the summit. Of course, it was Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay who finally managed to reach the summit of Everest in 1953. Hillary was interviewed about what he thought uh, about the uh, efforts of these previous climbers, George Mallory. And his reply was this, if you climb a mountain for the first time and die on the descent, is it really a complete first ascent of the mountain? And then he adds with very much New Zealander understatement and irony, he says this, I'm rather inclined to think personally that maybe it's quite important the getting down, alive that is. This evening, in Exodus 24, we come to another account of scaling a mountain. But actually, it is far, far, far more dangerous than going up to Everest. It is the mountain of the Lord. It is Mount Sinai, where the holy presence and glory of God is manifest. Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders are summoned to climb Mount Sinai. And there they will be confronted with the, glo the glorious and holy presence of God. And it is important that they return down again from that mountain. And it should be a staggering reality to us that these men were able to return alive from this mountain. And we'll see why that is the case. We're going to look firstly at the blood of the covenant applied to God and the people. Let's do a little bit of work, background work in the text, before we get to that first point. We've seen, haven't we, in recent sermons that the law of God is being given to the people. It's not immediately relevant why these laws are given. We see the Ten Commandments, an expression of God's holy character, and then these Ten Commandments being applied to the life of Israel in a social setting. And we saw that there are some principles that the Lord is establishing amongst his people as they separate themselves from the other nations and as they live as a sanctified, separated people. And we also saw that effective laws and good government is based on what God has revealed. We are not Israel. We distinguish between that nation state and our status in Christ this evening. Britain is not in any stretch of the imagination a Christian country, nor has it ever been. There's never been a condition where every single person has been a believer, but we do recognize that in our history the law of God, particularly revealed in the Ten Commandments, has had a significant impact on the laws that have been passed. 
as our society casts off the, the law of God, then we see laws that are passed that are contrary to the righteousness of God. But as the book of the covenant, the law of God is revealed and applied to the life of the children of Israel, we now come to chapter 24, where we see the, the covenant of God being established with his people. A, a covenant, a, a legal agreement between two parties that is entered into where uh, there are blessings and curses, there are responsibilities and privileges. Uh, and these are clearly spelt out. And this covenant agreement needs to be agreed on both sides. Now, we've all heard of the various treaties we have with Europe. If you have not, then please can you tell me what life is like on Mars, because you've been living there for the last 20 or so years. We know that the treaties that we have with Europe need to be ratified by the member states and changes to that, those treaties, like Brexit, need to be ratified by each member state. We understand how covenant works. Here we have God entering into a legal agreement with his people but it is the Lord alone who dictates the terms of the covenant. There's no negotiation. There's no, well, we'll give on this bit if you will compromise on, on this area. No, this is the sovereign God announcing the terms of his covenant, and they are non-negotiable terms. And what is taking place in this passage is... A great picture of a greater covenant that is to be fulfilled. And remember, we have seen on Mount Sinai, the holy, awesome God is being revealed. What a sight that must have been with the thunder and the lightning and the dark cloud and the earthquakes. Just the most awesome sight you could ever wish to see in the majesty and glory of God revealed there on Mount Sinai. The trumpet sounds and the mounting shakes, the thunder, the lightning, and the thick darkness. And Moses has ascended through that thick darkness and he's spent time with God as the mediator of the old covenant. Now let's come actually to our chapter and you see in verses 1 and 2, Moses is called to ascend the mountain of God. Come up to the Lord, he is told. And this time he is told to bring with him Aaron and Nadab and Abihu with the elders. Moses will go all the way up the mountain, but these will go some way up the mountain of the Lord. And what is interesting is that they don't actually ascend the mountain until verse 9. Did you notice that? There's the command to come up. But it's not until verse 9 that they actually go up the mountain. Why is that? Well, something very important needs to happen first. The, the covenant, this agreement between God and his people, needs to be confirmed. And that's what you see in verses 3 to 8. Twice, notice, Moses reads God's word to the people, once at the beginning and again at the end of the confirmation of the covenant. So verses 3 and 4, and again in verse 7. These are the terms of the covenant. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. He read them, the book of the covenant, in the hearing of the people. And both times, the people, all of them, 
respond positively. All the words of the Lord we will obey. All that the Lord has spoken, they say, we will do. And this is a bit of an aside, but it, it's important to understand that, that here we, we have a, a doctrine of, of Scripture being revealed to us, don't we? That here the words of God are written down, they are ins- inscripturated. And as Moses reads what God has said, he's reading the word of God to them. That's what Scripture is, the, the written word of God. It is the God-breathed word of God. It is communicated through human personality, but without error. And God has preserved his word for us. We do not have the original autographs. We don't have the book of Exodus, but we believe God in his providence, in his sovereignty, has preserved his word. So as we read God's word this evening, as we read Exodus 24, we were reading the word of God in our own language, the living and enduring, life-changing word of God. Of God. All scripture is breathed out by God, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And so when we hear the word of God, our response should be what the people say, all that the Lord says, we will do. Yes, this is the word of God for me, for us. And we will obey. And between the two readings of the law and their vows to commit to the Lord, look at verses 4 through to 8. Moses performs a fascinating and rather gruesome ritual. And when you read this passage, aren't you so glad you're a new covenant believer? He builds an altar at the foot of the mountain, 12 pillars all around it, according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And then there's the sacrifice of animals. Uh, The altar is symbolic of uh, the presence of of God who dwells on the mountain. Uh, The pillars represent the people Then in verse 5, Moses sends young men to make sacrifice, burnt offerings, and peace offerings. He takes half the blood notice. It is collected in basins, and some is thrown over the altar. Then after the people renew their vows, the rest is sprinkled over them. That's why I say, say it's a fascinating and yet gruesome picture that we have here. Verse 8, look, or as one translation says, behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord is making with you in accordance with all these words. There must be sacrifice. There must be the shedding of blood. This is the mechanism in which God, the holy God, will enter into covenant with his people. Atonement must be made for sin. A substitute was to die in the place of the people. And it's very important that we understand the order here. Half of the blood is thrown against the altar. That is to say, the blood is applied to the symbol of God's presence in the midst of the camp of his people. The first application, the primary application of the blood is not to the guilt of the people of Israel, but rather toward the wrath of a holy God that burns against the sin of Israel. The Bible has a word for this. It's called propitiation. The sacrifice that turns away the wrath of a holy God with sin. 
It means that a sacrifice that is made that satisfies the holy wrath and righteous condemnation of Almighty God that burns against us in in disobedience and the sin that we've committed. Atonement, you see, is firstly about God. Can I put it like this? Our biggest problem is not that we are sinners. Our biggest problem is that God is an infinitely holy God. And outside of Christ, we are under his wrath. So there's a a Godward application of the blood. And then in a second way, the blood is applied to the people. Here now is cleansing. And and again, there's a a word for, for this. Expiation. A sacrifice that deals with the guilt of sin. God's wrath must be dealt with and the guilt of sin must be dealt with. The the two must come together. We need propitiation and we need expiation. Now I use these words because it's helpful to understand them. You'll read them in theological books. Propitiation, the turning away of God's wrath. Expiation, the covering over the dealing with the guilt of sin. And the two must be held together if we are to understand the Bible's teaching of what it means to find forgiveness and acceptance with the Most Holy God. This is so clear that we must understand it. Here we are coming to the very heart of the gospel and what is being pictured here is ultimately the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, seeing there on that mountain the lightning and the thunder and the glory of God being revealed there. There is need for pardon and cleansing and for a sacrifice to be offered to deal with God's wrath and with the sin of the people, our sin. And so here's a a great, great picture. It's not the, the vows of the people that bring them acceptance, as important as these vows were in confirming the covenant. No, that wasn't the grounds of their acceptance. It was through blood sacrifice, substitution. It was through atonement. The blood of the altar, the blood applied to the altar and then applied to the people. And here we see, I trust, the importance of the Old Testament. This is how the early church understood the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They would have understood the cross in the light of Old Testament. And we we mustn't think, well, we don't need the Old Testament now that the cross is clearly revealed in in the New Testament. Here in a passage like this, there is such a revelation of what it requires to find acceptance and forgiveness with God, propitiation and expiation. A substitute must be offered. And how poignant, how powerful it is that Jesus himself, on that night of nights, when he institutes the Lord's table, says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Here Jesus is alluding back to what's happening here. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, and we read on, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. God was in Christ 
reconciling the world to himself. So, Jesus, the greater mediator, the one who brings in the better covenant, the new covenant, he is being pointed here. Verse 8, look, the blood of the covenant. Look to Christ Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood. Hebrews 12, 24. And so this evening, you must look to Jesus Christ and what he has done, his work, his person on your behalf to find acceptance, to find forgiveness, to find peace with God and to escape the horror of divine condemnation. It is Christ and Christ alone. It is his sacrifice, his blood that was shed. Of course, we need the cross. We need a substitute. We need a savior, a satisfier, a redeemer. We need Jesus. Nobody else can make us right with God. And here we have, in a passage like this, the glory of the Saviour and his cross work revealed to us. It's not about your goodness. It's not about how many vows you make. Lord, I will faithfully follow you this week. It's about looking to Christ and the new covenant found in him. Now let's move on and look at my second point more briefly, verses 9 to 18. First of all, you've got covenant confirmation. Now you've got covenant communion, covenant fellowship. Moses and Aaron and Nahab and Abihu and the 70 elders climb the mountains, the mountain, ascend there up into the presence of God. And look at verse 10. They saw the God of Israel. And there is some attempt to try and explain what the glory of God looked like. It's a fascinating insight, isn't it? There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven of clarity or clearness. It's some um, weak, feeble attempt of Moses here to try and explain to us the, the glorious sight that these people saw. They are looking up and beholding something of the glory of God, looking into the throne room of heaven. And the amazing thing about this description is not that it's so brief, or that, not that it's so fascinating, but they are meeting with this God and they are not consumed. Judgment does not fall upon them. We are told, aren't we, in Exodus 33, verse 20, no one may see me and live, that there is some sort of glimpse of the glory of God, not the fullest extent of it, but it doesn't result in their immediate total destruction. We are told in verse 11, it's an, an amazing thing. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he that is the living, holy, infinite God, did not lay his hand. So they saw God and they ate and drank. Do you realize the significance of what that means? Do you realize that within this culture to eat with someone, to have a meal with someone was not just satisfying your appetite, but it was a, a sign of fellowship, of relationship, of a deeper intimacy than you would have with a stranger. It was a family occasion usually. And so here's this picture of a profound social bond. God invites his people 
signified by these representative leaders into his presence and they eat food in his presence. Here you see the result and the effect of the atonement that's already been alluded to. Blood has been put on the altar, propitiation has been made and sprinkled over the people, expiation, covering for sin. And as a result, obviously prefiguring the final complete work of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is now communion and fellowship with God. They eat, they eat and drink in his presence. There is therefore now no condemnation. Fellowship, communion with one another and with God in his presence. That's what blood atonement does. That's what the work of Jesus does for us. It is about saving us from our sins, releasing us from God's judgment. It is about that. But it's about more than that. It's about fellowship and communion with the most holy God and with his Son by the Holy Spirit. It's not about the rituals. It's not about the outward show. It's about the inward reality of knowing God and being invited as new covenant believers to, to know him and to have fellowship with him and his son. That is the reality. You see, what happens here in verses 12 to 18 is a greater reality for every believer. Believer, you can have fellowship with this God. In fact, our Father in heaven is more pleased, is more, if I can use the word, anxious to have fellowship with us than we are to have with him. The door to his throne room is always open through the Savior. And of course, there's a Distinguishing between the, the people and Moses. Moses will go up on the mountain and spend 40 days and 40 nights there in the seeming immediate presence of God. But that is something that is given to us. We are not Moses. Yes, we appreciate his uniqueness in redemptive history, but through our Savior, we are accepted. We have access we can come to the throne of grace and find mercy and obtain grace to help in time of need. God is pleased to dwell with us. A better covenant has been made through our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is interesting to understand is that as the glory of God dwells on Mount Sinai, and the people glimpse something of that, we are told in the New Testament that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And what does John want to say to us about him? And we beheld his glory. What is this glory like? It is the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, which is a clear allusion to how God reveals himself in Exodus 34, which we will come to in a few weeks' time. So the glory of God that dwells on Mount Sinai in its fullest and most glorious extent dwells in Jesus. So as we have fellowship with him, we enter to a greater degree where Moses went. No one has ever seen God, but the only begotten Son who is in the Father's side, he has made him known. What an amazing picture of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of my prayers for this evening 
is that we would see the importance and value of the Old Testament and search the Old Testament and see Christ there. And then my second prayer for this evening was that we would see the finished and complete work of Jesus for us. His propitiation, his expiation for our sins. We cannot be our own saviors. You know, whatever you think of climate change and the environment, what is being presented to us continually is this. Man can be his own saviour. If we work enough, if we look after our carbon emissions and whatever the, the science is, I, I know there are arguments on both sides. I'm not going to get into that at all this evening. But man can be his own saviour now and for the future. And no, we cannot. Ultimately, we believe in global warming. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness? We cannot save ourselves. We must come to the foot of the cross and there, from a broken heart, cry out to a great Saviour who is mighty to save all who come to him. And there is no better way to end this evening by saying as we have come to him in faith and repentance we are received and accepted and we have fellowship with our God so let's remind ourselves and reinforce in our minds the cross of the Lord Jesus as we sing 231 and was it for my sin that Jesus suffered so when moved by his all-powerful love he came to earth below? Your holy law fulfilled, atonement now is made, and our great debt too great for us, he now has fully paid. Two, three, one.